Carl Jung's The Undiscovered Self was written during the middle of the Cold War. It was published in 1957. And so there's a tendency on the part of readers to read it through the lens of the Cold War. He certainly was writing with that lens in mind. And yet, if we're not careful, we won't see that uh, his message extends far beyond the specific concerns of the Cold War. And what I want to do is, uh, while providing a faithful um, interpretation of this book, uh, I want to especially focus on those parts of his argument that have more universal application, that transcend um, the particular situation that he was writing in and uh, may help us to think about our own. We will find that Jung is not simply aiming his barbs at communism when he refers to state slavery, which is a term he uses several times in this book. Instead, he's m more aiming his barbs at uh, a sort of scientific rationalism. He's asking, what happens when we see human beings as statistics, or mass man, and not as individuals? And I think that's a problem that we certainly share with those times, and probably even more so. But it has evolved, and it has changed, and it has grown in, in different ways. So we'll explore that as we move along. He says fairly early on in this first chapter of The Undiscovered Self, which is entitled The Plight of the Individual in Modern Society, anyone who has ego consciousness at all takes it for granted that he knows himself, but the ego knows only its contents, not the unconscious and its contents. We need to keep that in mind as we read this book because Ultimately, Carl Jung is a psychologist, and ultimately he's going to go back to the human psychological makeup for the answers that he seeks. And he's saying there that we don't really understand ourselves very well, hence the title of the book, The Undiscovered Self. There's something about us that, that we don't understand, and we need to understand more than ever, I think, uh, Jung believes, uh, in order for us to avoid cataclysmic political crises. So we don't even know really half ourselves, according to Jung, but he points out that we think that we are completely in control. However, the evidence of history suggests otherwise. He depicts modern society as a powder keg where even the more rational people, which he talks about being about 40% of the electorate, um, can turn into fanatics if there's a crisis because somehow people are on the edge of becoming completely absorbed in the mass and completely, collect, completely collective in their uh, beliefs and in their actions, um, and they're teetering on that abyss. He notes that there are uh, minorities within the populations of Europe, is, is mainly what he's talking about, um, that are have already become uh, what we would call radicalized, uh, or fanatics, as he would call them. But he very quickly says, most everybody can become fanatics under the right conditions, and he just lived through it with the rise of Nazism and then, you know, the, the, fortunately, the defeat of Nazism or Nazi Germany, um, but then the rise of, of uh, the Soviet Union. The term he uses several times in this work to describe such movements is collective possession. And as I've already mentioned, several videos I've done on what I call ideological possession. That's also a term that Jung uses. Um, I like the term uh, because it, it fuses the message that he's going to give about the necessity for a certain type of religious outlook to avoid this political um, fanaticism. So it, it fuses his point about religion and his point about politics together. The problem that he's going to spend a lot of time on in this chapter is the so-called statistical method or statistical approach to dealing with people and to dealing with problems. The statistical method deals with people in terms of averages and probabilities and attempts to find a one-size-fits-all solution for managing various problems in society, for managing people themselves, for managing the economy, uh, etc. So for Jung, like for Hans Morgenthau, this is the age of scientific man. 
He says, scientific knowledge not only enjoys universal esteem, but in the eyes of modern man, it counts as the only intellectual and spiritual authority. And this is where Jung uh, thinks that we have made a, a terrible mistake. Jung is not anti-science, but he has noticed that people have tried to apply the scientific um, outlook and the scientific method to every sphere of life, and maybe the most uh, problematic is in uh, the area of politics, society, culture, even economics. Scientific rationalism sees the individual then as a unit or a statistic, uh, a normal or average subject, a constituent, a consumer, uh, but not as a unique human being. And as societies grow bigger and wealthier, this tends to become more and more the case, to the point where, as I've mentioned in other videos, the governments themselves start to see us not as citizens uh, who may have a contrary point of view and push back or try to make demands, uh, but as consumers to be served. And the government takes on this sort of managerial focus. But Jung says the unique individual is the bearer of reality. Mass man is an abstraction and a human idea used for methodological purposes. In other words, there's no such thing as mass man. It's an idea or a construct um, that is useful for manipulating uh, people, for you know passing laws, regulations, for selling people things, etc. But um, it it is not a real. Uh, entity. Only the individual, he says, is the bearer of reality, the one who experiences it, the one who really makes it. But the scientific worldview or statistical worldview is very, very strong. He says, we ought not to underestimate the psychological effect of the statistical world picture. It displaces the individual in favor of anonymous units that pile up into mass formations. Science supplies us with instead of the concrete individual, the names of organizations, and at the highest point, the abstract idea of the state as the principle of political reality. Now, again, reading this back in 1957, probably most people would have thought, ah, the Soviet state and the threat of communism impeding upon you know, the freedom of the West, this is what we need to fear. And yet that's not what, what Jung is saying. He doesn't repeatedly refer back to Soviet state or the socialist state. He capitalizes the state and he treats the state as a more general idea. And in fact, the Western liberal democracies are not immune from this abstract idea of the state or this um, statistical world picture. He's referring, among other things, to the idea that more and more People look to the state for the source of their salvation, so to speak, if they have a problem. This would be particularly the case after World War II, uh, when these countries you know, had to develop a bigger apparatus for dealing with the conflict and became seen as the really the barrier between, you know, standing between the, the, their citizens and destruction. And so before we sort of decide to dismiss this and say, well, we're not, uh, we don't need to worry about this, think about how we in what, what Jung would call the West or, you know, Europe and the United States, Canada, um, we tend to think of the state, and I don't mean the smaller units, but the national level state apparatus as the source of the solution of most of our problems, or at least most of the big problems. And of course, this is the source of a great deal of frustration because the state doesn't seem to ever be able to deliver, and yet it grows ever bigger and more complex and really quite oppressive um, in ways in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in our lives. Certainly, as I've discussed in other videos, much more involved in our economies, which are not free by any stretch of the imagination. He says the individual is increasingly deprived of the moral decision as to how he should live his own life and instead is ruled, fed, clothed, 
and educated as a social unit, accommodated in the appropriate housing unit, and amused according to the standards that give pleasure and satisfaction to the masses. Well, it certainly does describe Soviet communism, but when you think about it, you pick that apart, you find that it applies to our lives to a great extent as well. Are we increasingly deprived of a moral decision as to how we should live our own lives? We certainly look to experts at every turn and we rely on um, popular opinion a great deal, celebrity a great deal. And he says that we are instead ruled, fed, and clothed and educated as a social unit. Well, as Tocqueville pointed out a long time ago, uh, there tends to be quite a bit of conformism in a society such as ours, even though we speak of the individual, but you can't get too far out of line without becoming uh, sort of unmutual. Accommodated in the appropriate housing unit? Well, maybe not, but we do, you know, we have these standards, right, about how you're supposed to live. Many people can't afford it but that's what everybody strives for. And you get into such a house and a lot of times it looks just exactly like everybody else's, so I don't know. And of course, I totally think we suffer from being amused according to the standards that give pleasure and satisfaction to the masses. Government doesn't dictate all of this, but the economy has a great deal to do in promoting it. So Jung says, as individuals lose their sense of efficacy and agency more and more, they turn to the state as a, quote, quasi-animate personality from whom everything is expected. In reality, he says, it is only a camouflage for those who know how to manipulate it. Thus, the constitutional state drifts into a situation of a primitive form of society, namely the communism of a primitive tribe where everybody is subject to the autocratic rule of a chief or oligarchy. I guess you can ask yourself whether we, we see the state that way, uh, whether you see the government as a quasi-animate personality from whom everything is expected. I know certain ideologies um, would say otherwise, and yet I think we need to look at our, our actions and what we really actually think and do on a daily basis. Now, when he says that the constitutional state drifts into a situation of a primitive form of society, namely the communism of a primitive tribe, he's talking about collectivism, as in society becomes a mass. It becomes tribal, and it looks to the leader. And so the leader becomes this chieftain, or if more than one, an oligarchy. An oligarchy is the rule of the rich and powerful. So this communism that he's referring to here is not the Soviet-style communism. He's talking about the communism of the, of the mind and of the mentality, or a, a form of conformism and collectivism that basically looks upward, above, for help and for answers and for authority and for assurance and all of that. In that sense, we are all communists, or at least almost all. That's the last sentence in chapter one, and I wanted to make those comments because it can be easily read as just another swipe at Soviet communism, but he doesn't mention a country here. Communism is lowercase. He speaks about it in the same sentence as primitive tribalism, autocracy, and oligarchy. So he's talking about something more than that. And he's talking about looking up to and relying upon and basically being dependent upon this superior power instead of thinking for yourself, instead of doing for yourself in the cooperation with other individuals whom you know. Um, you rely upon this sort of higher entity, um, which is rather faceless, although the face of it becomes then these types of folks that you see here in this picture. So chapter two is religion as the counterbalance to mass mindedness. For those of you who aren't religious or even for those of you who are, this approach, the Jungian approach to religion, may be pretty uncomfortable 
might not be something you want to entertain, and yet I think it's worth um, learning about and, and, and entertaining. He says all socio-political movements tending towards autocratic rule try to cut the ground from under religions, and that would be because they don't want any competition. So Jung is looking at religion uh, primarily through the lens of social, political, psychological efficacy. And he's, he's basically going to argue that it's more efficacious um, for people to have a living religious faith than not, because without it, um, autocratic rule has no competition. The reasoning goes that religions give people an otherworldly point of reference, a source of opposition and personal strength to oppose turning into a mass, to be able to oppose the authority and the power structures. Um, it gives them a point of reference in which they are, in a sense, in between uh, God and uh, the dehumanized or animalistic earth. Religion's authority, ideally, does not try to impose heaven on earth because that's the, that's the mistake that the communists made that in their own warped way the Nazis made that any sort of ideologue makes is that they can, they understand what perfection is and through their program, they will impose it and make everybody uh, conform. So, but, but Jung says religion's authority doesn't try to impose this heaven on earth idea, but allows man the in-between position of not being a dehumanized statistic or a god. I borrow the term in-between or metaxi from Eric Vogelin because it fits very well here. Vogelin said, the man who lives in the erotic tension to his ground of being is called the daimonios aner, that is, a man who consciously exists in the tension of the in-between, metaxi, in which the divine and the human partake of each other. Now, many people think, well, the religious uh, institutions put them up to be some sort of absolute authority, too, and Jung's going to have more to say about that. But as for now, I would just say that when there are two authorities that are equally pressing for your allegiance, you now have a choice between the two, and there's this tension. And even the tension is good, because without that, there is just one, uh, which is sort of a demanding your allegiance um, in a rather forceful way, in a worldly way, that is difficult to resist without some sort of alternative inspiration. But Jung says there's a problem with religion, and he's going to go into this more as the book progresses. But religions tend to emphasize creeds, he says, instead of a you know true living faith. Um, and they tend to become worldly and political. And this is not helpful because he says the value of religion lies in its, ex as he says, at extra mundane points of reference. That is, its otherworldly points of reference. It opposes the unworldly or otherworldly to the worldly and political, but too often religions conform to the world and become little more than extensions of political power. Then they lose their um, utility, really, in a, uh, from the psychological perspective. They, they lose any utility for human beings. They don't serve their unique purpose, is what he's saying. He says, it is not ethical principles, however lofty, or creeds, however orthodox, that lay the foundations for the freedom and autonomy of the individual, but simply and solely the empirical awareness, the incontroversible, an incontrovertible experience of an intensely personal reciprocal relationship between man as, and an extra mundane authority, which acts as a counterpoint to the world and its reason. Ethical principles, in other words, and creeds are the foundation of worldly institutions that, could, that can become oppressive or can serve the interests of the world, or as Walter Brueggemann would call it, empire. And the antidote for that is incontrovertible experience of an intensely personal, reciprocal relationship between man and an otherworldly authority. That's a tall order.
incontrovertible experience of an intensely personal and reciprocal relationship that ultimately can be facilitated by institutions, I think, from his perspective, but is not something that institutions can bestow, but has to be experienced by the individual through the individual's efforts and the meeting of those efforts by some perceived exterior authority. So, but for the political situation, he says in this chapter two, the state has taken the place of God. That is why, seen from this angle, the socialist dictatorships are religions and state slavery is a form of worship. But the religious function cannot be dislocated and falsified in this way without giving rise to secret doubts, which are immediately repressed so as to avoid conflict with the prevailing trends towards mass-mindedness. The result is overcompensation in the form of fanaticism, which in turn is used as a weapon for stamping out the least flicker of opposition. So what I think he's saying is that fanaticism is stirred by the dissatisfaction that people have with a secular god. Uh, they want it to be perfect, but it continues to disappoint. And so in the secular perspective or the rational scientistic perspective, then it simply hasn't been done well enough and it needs to be purified. That is the political process, uh, the political institutions. They need to be purified. They need to be put on the right track. This is where fanaticism starts. And then he says the leader becomes uh, or can become a demigod beyond good and evil as the people begin to put their their um, hope, their uh, desires, their aspirations, their intense feelings and need for, um, you know, true authority and leadership onto a even a single individual. So I'm not all the way through chapter two. I thought this was a good place to break because the, the next part of chapter two gets into some uh, different points. And so uh, what I'd like to do is just invite you to, if you've, if you've been reading along, or even if you haven't, um, to uh, make comments, uh, ask questions, um, you know, tell people how you see uh, what he's saying. Let's try to understand what Jung is, is, is actually trying to get across and also uh, how it might actually benefit us now. Um, and I'll look forward to hearing from you and, um, and I will be on later on in the week and see if there's, any, if there's anything I can, um, any questions I can answer or any, any points that you guys have that I should consider. All right. Thanks. I'll see you next time. Bye.